hello and welcome back to a new Dhamma video or a new study uh, I guess so well, last the last video I did was on the Sakapanha Sutta a discourse given by the venerable Mahasi Sayadaw and so continuing on from that um, we're now going to be reading aloud uh, the Arya Vasa Sutta, and um, this is going to be another discourse by the venerable monk Mahasi Sayara. And I'm just going to let probably the introduction uh, do the work. And so we're here uh, at the Buddha Center and in second life and we're sitting here next to the Buddha and so before we begin let's just do uh, pay homage to the Blessed One Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa and for a second time Namo tassa Pagawato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa And for a third time Namo Tassa Pagawato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Homage to the Blessed One, the Worthy One, and the Rightly Self Awakened One. And Let's see here. I don't think uh, there's uh, anything else to say. I mean, make sure you have the text before you so you can read along yourself. And uh, I'll make sure to put the text, or I mean, the link to the text below. And um, yeah, so. I think uh, let's just uh, see. It's uh, I can't really wait to actually get into the reading because I just uh, yeah I've been uh, I actually wanted to read this even before the Sakapanna Sutta, but I think the Sakapanna Sutta would be more um this Sutta would actually be more approachable if one reads the Sakapanha first and so let's just see um, but we're going to start reading now with the uh, introduction and so here we go this is a new and enlarged translation of the venerable Mahasi Sayadaw's discourse on the Aryavasa uh, Sutta of the Ankuttara Nikaya just check in my mic here so I don't get so I don't actually um, what's that make too much uh, distracting sounds so I hope the audio is good and the video seems fine from here and so we're gonna continue therefore it differs considerably from the condensed English version which I wrote in uh, 1980 for the Mahasi's Translation Committee. It is far more thorough and comprehensive, and it is an indication of this distinctive feature that the book contains nearly five times the number of pages in the original than that of the original translation. There is no doubt about uh, the universal appeal of Mahasi's sermons in Buddhist Myanmar. This is no wonder, for given the venerable uh, Sayadaw's saintly life and his extensive knowledge of Buddhist lecture, he deservedly earned the deep faith and veneration of the people. He had a flair effective delivery of his sermons 
that brought home to us the fundamental teachings of Buddha Dhamma. Moreover, in his talks he often referred to little known but highly significant Buddhist teachings that give us much food for thought. For example, in his sermon on the Aryavasa Sutta, the venerable Sayadaw described two kinds of bhikkhu. These the Vinaya Bhikkhu, or a member of the Sangha, and the Sutta Bhikkhu, or the disciple, Upasaka, who lives up to the Buddhist teaching. In other words, the term Bhikkhu is general is the general designation for any dedicated follower of the Buddha, be he a monk, a hermit, or a layman. This may be surprising to many Buddhists, but it is quite in line with the Buddhist teaching. Says the Dhammapada, verse 142, Whatever the garments a man may wear, he is a Brahmana or a Sammana or a Bhikkhu if he has got rid of defilements disciplined himself, avoids doing evil, and cultivates loving-kindness. Again, in his dialogue with the ascetic, the Buddha said that there were hundreds of lay disciples, both men and women, who had attained the first three stages on the Aryan holy path, the Maha Vacha Gotasutta from the Majjhima Nikaya. These are only a few of the Pali texts that give the l Okay, so I just wanted to be sure that I was reading correctly. These are only a few of the Pali texts that give the lie to some Western writers on Buddhism who would have us believe that the higher teachings of Buddhism is meant exclusively for the monks and that there is no place for the lay followers in its scheme for salvation. The main topic of the Venerable Sayada's talk on the Arya Vasa Sutta is the ten Arya Dhammas or the ten essential attributes of the Aryas or the Noble Ones. In particular, the talk focuses on the practice of right mindfulness based on the Satipatthana Sutta. Of course, Right mindfulness is the cornerstone of Buddhist mental culture and, the, and here it is worthy uh, of note that the Buddhist teaching has much in common with modern psychology. The practice of right mindfulness is generally of three kinds. In the first place, the beginner in the practice is told to make himself aware of everything, mental or physical, that occurs within the range of his sensory impressions. He has no difficulty in mentally noting pleasant feelings, desires, perceptions, uh, etc. It is, however, otherwise in the case of unpleasant or unwholesome states of consciousness for then his ego or deep-seated conceit stands in the way of his recognizing anything that hurts his self-esteem. So he tends to ignore it unconsciously. Thus, the unwholesome desires or emotions such as anger or envy disappear beyond the threshold of consciousness and become potential threats to mental health. The connection between mental disorders and the unconscious, which modern psychology has conclusively established, 
was well known to the Buddha more than 2,500 years ago. Hence, his emphasis on the need to recognize one's own moral weakness and avoid self-deception in the, the Maha Satipatthana and other suttas. See my translation of Mahasi Sayada's talk on the Salika Sutta. And this was kind of a footnote from the translator. We're still in the introduction. I think it's a good one. So, continuing on. The second kind of mindfulness that we can hardly overemphasize is what is known in Pali as ikagata or one-pointedness of mind. It consists in focusing on one's atten focusing one's attention on a single idea or object for a long time to the exclusion of everything else. It forms the basis of the so-called willpower which is not, as many people believe, some mysterious mental force that some great men have acquired without any effort or practice. As the famous American psychologist William James says, the essential achievement of the will is to attend to a difficult object and to hold it and to hold it fast before the mind. Effort of attention is thus the essential phenomenon of the will. The vital role of one pointed mindfulness in making of great men is no doubt is in no doubt it is indomitable will or singleness of purpose English words for ikakata uh, that distinguishes great teachers like the venerable Mahasi Sayara or great national leaders like Bokyoki Aung San but from the Buddhist point of view it is indispensable to our welfare since it helps us to cope with the moral problems of life. Equally essential, equally essential to our mor moral well-being is the kind, is the third kind of mindfulness or yoni somanasikara which we may translate as right or proper thinking. Another appropriate English word for it is wise reflection, whereby we seek to overcome intellectual, intellectually uh, the moral weaknesses that trouble us in everyday life. Let us consider for example, envy, which the Buddha described as one of the two sources of human suffering in the Sakapanha Sutta. And we just went through that uh, last time. See my translation of the Venerable Sayadaw's talk on the Sutta. And let me just extend the courtesy and invite you to go and look up my video on reading um, this translator's translation of the Venerable Mahasi Saira's talk on the Sakapanna Sutta. Okay. Most people do not like anyone who surpasses them in wealth, education, power, and so forth. They are unmindful of the Buddha's repeated saying that we should not consider ourselves superior or equal or inferior to any pers any other person. Then how are we to overcome envy? In the first place, uh, probably we may have to admit f uh, frankly that the man we envy is getting his reward for his special qualifications. If, on the other hand, 
he has employed morally wrong devices for the fulfillment of his wish. We have no reason to envy a man whose conduct outrages our senses of moral values. Again, let us remember that more often than not, the life of a successful man is married by ill health, unhappy marriage, etc., that overshadow his achievements and make him someone to be pitied rather than envied. Thus, the practice of Yoni Somanasikara is based on right understanding, intelligence and knowledge. For we need to mobilize all intellectual forces in the struggle against our inner impurities. Certainly, we all owe a deep debt of gratitude to the venerable Mahasi Sayadaw for his untiring, selfless effort to promote the knowledge of Buddhism and the Buddhist meditation. But speeches and writings in praise of his life and work will not suffice to do full justice to the grandeur of a great holy teacher whose name is immortalized in the history of the Theravada Buddhism. What matters most for those who cherish the memory of the Venerable Sayada is to try to live up to his teachings. That is our sacred duty in keeping with the tradition of the Buddha Dhamma. For, as pointed out in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, just before he passed away, the Buddha told Ananda that the only way for his disciples to adore, <coughs> to adore and honor him was to follow his teachings strictly and diligently. And therefore, it is up to all devotees of the Venerable Mahasi Saira to practice right mindfulness at all times and in every place. For, at the very last, it is the best insurance against preventable diseases and accidents that take heavy toll of life worldwide. More important for those who are disillusioned for those who are disillusioned with samsaric existence, it is the most reliable passport to supreme liberation. Yu Aye Maung, the translator. The 30th of April 1993, Yangon. Chapter 1 Discourse on the Aryawasa Dhamma. My sermon tonight has its source in the Aryawasa Sutta of Ankutta Nikaya. It is customary for us to prepare a sermon on the basis of uh, the Buddha's talk in the Sutta. It is possible to focus on a teaching of the Buddha without reference to any Pali text in the Pitaka, but we believe that a discourse based on an original Pali text is more significant and profound. The sermons of the Buddha are called suttas, a Pali term of wide connotation. One interesting thing which it signifi uh, signifies is a string or a guideline. When a carpenter is about to divide, cut into pieces, or turn into any shape a log of wood, he must first mark a line. This is of course common knowledge. If due to his overconfidence he relies on guesswork, he will certainly make a mess of his job. The outcome will be in harmony with his desire only if he works with the help of a guideline. This holds true also for the study of the Buddha's teaching. The suttas embodying the Buddha's instructions 
are guidelines for those who wish to practice the Dhamma. It is up to every Buddhist to follow these guidelines in his religious life. For instance, it is the duty of Buddhists to conform to the guidelines laid down by the Buddha for leading a morally good life. He should not invent a new system of ethics. He should observe the five precepts, namely abstinence from killing, stealing, etc., as taught by the Buddha. It is not his business to reduce or increase the number of precepts. Again, we should bear in mind the Buddha's guidelines for developing samadhi, tranquility. There are 40 Buddhist methods of cultivating samadhi and we need not seek any other technique for mental culture. This is important, pointing out that we need not seek any other technique for mental culture. The Buddha's guidelines for the development of panya, wisdom or insight knowledge, are manifold. He spelled them out in terms of the five khandhas, groups, the ayatanas, the sources on which mental process depends, or datu, the elements. There are guidelines for the attainment of wisdom on the basis of the Four Noble Truths, the Conditioned Origination, Paticca Samubara, or Mind and corpore Corporeality, Nama Rupa. <coughs> Thus, the suttas serve as a guideline for the study of the Buddha Dhamma, just as we write on lined paper to make a script neat and tidy, so also we make it a practice to preach on the basis of suttas for the spiritual uplift of the lay people. Different kinds of aryas. The Buddha said, monks there are ten Aryavasa Dhammas that form the abode of the Aryas, the noble ones. The Aryas lived in these abodes, abodes in the past, they are still living there, and they will live there in the future. Arya denotes the eight types of noble ones or saints and awa, awasa means abode or residence and hence arya awasa refers to the abode of the noble ones there are eight types of aryas the first four and the category of those who have attained the path, Makkha, viz. or uh, meaning Suttapati, Anagami, Sakadagami, and Arahatta, and the other four who have attained uh, the Pala or fruition corresponding to each of the four paths. As to the first four Aryas who are well established on the path, it is hard to say explicitly what kind of noble ones they are. For the duration of their spiritual climax is a single thought moment. With the attainment of insight knowledge, the meditating yogi realizes Nibbana at the Aryan level and while having this split-second experience, he is called the Makkha Arya. Then there follows immediately the Arya Pala, fruition, consciousness, and from that time he is called the Pala Arya. 
In short, the Pala Yogis are those. Oh, I'm sorry. In short, the Pala Yogis are the only saints whom we can definitely point out as the Aryas or noble ones visible in the world. This is known to most of the practicing yogis, but I have elucidated it because otherwise my sermon may not be comprehensive. The Aryas live in the Aryavasa, or the abode of the noble ones. The other words, oh I'm sorry, in other words, they live in accordance with the ten Aryavasa Dhammas proclaimed by the Buddha. Katama Dasa Itta Pikkawe Suvimutta Panyo If one understands Pali, it is very pleasant to hear it spoken. Some of the yogi disciples who have a fairly good knowledge of Pali say that they feel ecstatic when they hear Pali recitation in my sermons. We wonder how much ecstasy a disciple would have if he heard the Pali words uttered by the Buddha himself. This feeling is called Dhamma Pitti in Pali. And Dhamma Pitti means Dhamma joy. Pitti means joy. It may arise merely on hearing the Dhamma in Pali or when the yogi appreciates the significance of the Dhamma that is in tune with his life experience. But for many laymen Pali is difficult to understand and they tend to become drowsy at in the end. So I will express my quotation in Myanmar remembering we're reading the translation in English. Bhikkhus, what are the Aryavasa Dhammas? Within the fold of my teaching, the bhikkhu, who is well aware of the perils of life cycle, samsara, seeks to eradicate the defilements, kilesas, two kinds of bhikkhus. There are two kinds of bhikkhus, namely the Vinaya Bhikkhu and the Sutta Bhikkhu. The Vinaya Bhikkhu is of course the monk who leads a good life based on Vinaya rules. And the Vinaya is the Buddhist teaching on morality and right conduct. In the time of the Buddha, the Lord himself ordained some of them by saying, Ehi Bhikkhu, come hither Bhikkhu. Most of them, however, were ordained by the Sangha in accordance with the Vinaya rules. According to the commentaries, the Sutta Bhikkhu is any person who practices the Dhamma to get liberated from the cycle of life. He is not necessarily a member of the Sangha, for he may be a Dewa or a layman. The bhikkhu referred to in the Arya Vasa Sutta is the Sutta Bhikkhu, a term that applies to any human being, Dewa or Brahma, who is committed to the practice of Dhamma. Commitment to the Dhamma consists in the practice of morality, concentration, and wisdom. It's a say tranquility, samadhi, sila, samadhi, and panya. By virtue of his moral purity, the yogi overcomes active defilements with takkama, Kilesa, such as greed, hatred, uh, and delusion, that leads 
to grave moral transgressions like killing, stealing, lying, and so forth. The yogi who develops tranquility, samadhi, is able to forestall the eruption of dormant pariyutana, kilesa, defilement. Finally, the yogi develops insight knowledge and wisdom thereby overcoming potential defilements that still lie latent in us anusaya kilesa and arise under uh, relevant circumstances uh, these kilesas to clarify uh, the practice of the dhamma is somewhat like cutting away uh, a piece of wood with a small axe, each stroke helping to get rid of the unwanted fragments or digging the earth with a spade and making the heaps of earth come out one after another. Likewise, if we constantly make a note of all the psychophysical phenomena arising from the six sense organs, uh, the ayatanas, the defilements become weak and wither away in due course of time. Thus, when the yogi develops insight knowledge, vipassana panya, he is in effect doing away with defilements. Such a yogi is designated as a sutta bhikkhu, regardless of his outward appearance as a layman or monk or a dewa and I think uh, just my own comment that the Mahasi Saira has blessed us with um, his brilliance and radiance in pointing this out to us so that we might remember this Dhamma continuing on the ten Aryavasa Dhammas. According to the Pitaka, there are ten Aryavasa Dhammas, and the first of these Dhammas is the elimination of the five hindrances Nivarana, Nivarana, Nivarana. All, okay, let me just see, the five hindrances. Okay, so. They are, the five hindrances are uh, disliking or uh, aversion and desire and drowsiness and distraction and doubt. It just didn't uh, come up from the text here. So Nivarana are those five. All over the world people live in houses made of bricks, wood, cement, etc buildings that protect them from the heat of the sun, cold or the rainy season, robbers, insects, reptiles, and other perils of life. But there are many more dangers in the round of, of births uh, in samsara. If we live in an abode which, unlike the abode of the Aryas, is devoid of security, So those who live in the abode devoid of security should seek out the Aryan abode, the Aryavasa. And so, here we are. Continuing on in the text. The perils of samsara are more deadly and formidable, formidable than those threatening a man who does not live in a well-protected house the insecurity of a ramshackle house does not matter much when compared with the potential evils of samsara that may follow a man from one existence to another. Evils that are really very frightening. One may, for instance, land in one of the four lower worlds as a denizen of hell, a peta, 
or an animal, or he may be reborn as a poor, wretched man who has to suffer much just for bare survival or because of the cruelties of other people. Nor is a wealthy man spared the universal evils of life, these, or namely, sickness, old age and death. Common people cannot escape the evils that will be that will bedevil them uh, throughout their life cycles. Liberation is attained only by the Buddha and the Arahants who practice the Aryavasa Dhammas. So the Buddha proclaimed the Dhammas that would provide the best insurance against the perils of samsara. So the first Aryavasa Dhamma requires uh, the bhikkhu to remove the five hindrances, which I will explain later. Okay, so we're gonna get the explanation later. There's much to come still. The second Dhamma calls for the exercise of self-control in regard to uh, the six sense objects. Uh, the third Dhamma stresses the need for a guard or mindfulness. We may liken the Aryan abode to the home of a well-to-do man or high official who keeps guards to ensure security of life and property. The, four, the fourth Dhamma points to the need for uh, four supports. The fifth Dhamma requires the yogi to renounce many religious systems. Pachika Satcha, like uh, private uh, rituals, kind of, other than the doctrine of the Buddha. These non Buddhist creeds claim monopoly of truth, although they do not accord with the nature of life. The sixth, sixth, it's a hard word. The sixth Aryavasa Dhamma emphasizes the need for giving up all pursuits once and forever. The Pali text is hard to understand, but it clearly insists on the renunciation of all pursuits. The pursuit of something implies the lack of self-sufficiency, whereas giving up all pursuits is a sign of non-attachment and self-fulfillment. The seventh Dhamma says that the mind of the yogi in the Aryan abode is clear and free from confusion. The eighth Dhamma is the possession of quiet bodily function, Pasara Kaya Sankara. Here Kaya Sankara means in and out breathing. That's a bodily Sankara. So the breath itself is a Sankara. But this shows only that if the yogi can cover the whole range of spiritual experience, so much the better for him. What matters most is the extinction of the defilements and the attainment of arahantship. For in fact, there are many arahants who reach the supreme goal without attaining the fourth jhana. The ninth and tenth Aryavasa Dhamma underscores the fully liberated mind and the fully liberated knowledge of the awareness of one's freedom from defilements. These two dhammas are linked together. With the full liberation of the mind that arises simultaneously, the intellectual appreciation of it through wisdom. The 
guard of mindfulness. Now. Now we will begin with the third Arya Vasa Dhamma because from the practical point of view it enables the yogi to understand the Buddha's teaching easily. The third Dhamma emphasizes the importance of a guard in the Aryan abode. This guard is no other than mindfulness, the essential attribute of the Arahat. The Arahant is well fortified with mindfulness, Sati, which pervades every also mindfulness, Sati, which is most often translated as mindfulness. It means like something like recollections, recollection or remembrance or even recognition uh, recognizing things or phenomena as they arise for what they are and recognizing the cessation of all the recent phenomena as well so sati means remembrance, recollection, mindfulness or uh, recognize recognition Typically, we just say mindfulness, filling the mind with a clear awareness of arising and ceasing phenomena. So I'm just going to start this line over one more time. The Arahant is well fortified with mindfulness, Sati, which pervades every state of his consciousness. He is mindful of whatever he does physically, verbally, or mentally. There is nothing which he does absent-mindedly. Hence, he never acts, says, or thinks wrongly or foolishly. The Arhant is reputed for his constant mindfulness, and the commentaries say that he is mindful even when he is asleep. So, some monks say that you cannot be mindful when you're sleeping. Um, I have some experiences that counter that argument very, very vividly. And so, I'm very happy to read this. One more time. The Arahant is reputed for his constant mindfulness. And the commentaries say that he is mindful even when he is asleep. But this is rather impossible, and it may refer to his mindfulness just before he falls asleep and immediately after he wakes up. In any case, we should note especially that the Arahant is always on his guard whatever he is doing at any moment in his life. So, because an Arahant doesn't dream, um, he would not actually be mindful in his sleep. But um, before entering into the sleep state, uh, he would be mindful up until he falls asleep. Um, and if, say, he does not enter into actual uh, sleep state, he might enter into a trance. And uh, that's not actually defined as sleep, right? So anyway. Mindfulness does not appear suddenly with the attainment of arahantship. It develops gradually as a result of previous effort and practice. It is fairly well established at the anagami stage before the yogi becomes an arahant. And this is due to self-training at the sakadagami level. There too, the yogi possesses mindfulness for which the foundation has been laid at the suttapana stage. In fact, even, uh, even at the first stage of the Aryan path, the yogi is quite mindful, mindful in comparison with the common people. So, the suttapana yogi avoids doing evils that lead to the lower worlds. He is not yet free from sensuous desire, ill will, hatred, conceit, and greed, 
but these are not powerful enough to end up in killing and other grave misdeeds. So these unwholesome qualities have been weakened so much to the extent that they are not powerful enough to from the point of Suttapana uh, they are not powerful enough to actually materialize through a Suttapana. His unwholesome passions have become weak because of his mindfulness and self-restraint. This is well known to those who practice meditation. Non-meditators need Non meditators need not have any doubt since the Buddha himself stated that a Suttapana would never do any evil that would consign consign him to the lower worlds. We know fairly well from experience that what the Buddha said is quite true. The yogi can find it out for himself if he practices mindfulness seriously. When he has made some progress in his practice, he knows what it means. At the sight of a pleasant object, he craves for it. Oh, at the sight of a pleasant object, he craves for it, and in the face of unpleasant object, he resents it for he is not yet freed from greed and hatred. But when these emotions become violent, his mindfulness stands him in good stead and helps him, res and helps rest him restrain them. Said emotions. Um, thus they lose their momentum and become weak. They are not beyond control, as in the case of common people. Although greed and hatred occasionally arise, these defilements are not potent enough to make the yogi capable of killing, stealing, or telling a lie harmful to the welfare of other people. Hence, the Buddha's emphasis on the moral invulnerability of a suttapana at the initial stage of the holy path. The heresy of a popular writer. A well known Myanmar writer has recently expressed his mistaken view about the Suttapana Aryas. Some readers might have come across his te his writings. Unfortunately for them, might I add probably puffed up with pride for his literary reputation. He has written nonsense to the point of saying that it is possible for a Suttapana to commit homicide. His view is downright degrading to the spiritual status of a Suttapana, and we wonder at his senseless audacity. He has aggravated the damage to the Buddhist teaching by writing not only in Myanmar but also in a local English magazine. We are concerned that foreigners might have a low opinion of Myanmar and the responsibility for it rests in part with the editors who accepted the article that is harmful to the interest of our country and our religion. Such an article might express the cherished view of the writer, but the editors should not have given publicity to it. Today we are promoting the study of the Buddhist teaching on a high scale that reached its climax in the convention of the Sixth, Buddhi Sixth Buddhist Council 
As for the practice of the Dhamma, we are giving instructions that stress the need for empirical approach to meditation. Foreigners from all over the world are coming to Myanmar to study and practice the Buddha Dhamma. At first, some went to India and Sri Lanka. They did not get any help in India and in Sri Lanka. There was no one to guide them thoroughly. Then, at last, on the advice of some Buddhists in those countries, they came to Myanmar, and when they practiced meditation, they found it agreeable and satisfying. There have been many such foreign yogis at our meditation center. At a time when there is the nationwide movement for the rena renaissance of Buddha Dhamma in Myanmar, the forementioned view of the writer linking the Suttapana Arya with homicide is damaging to the Aryan noble path of the Buddha. The Hindus of India strictly uphold the doctrine of Ahimsa that forbids ill-treating or killing any living being. Ahimsa means harmlessness, right? In Pali. In the time of the Buddha, they applied the doctrine even to plant life, saying that plants too have sensibilities like human beings. So, in order to alien so in order not to alienate them, the Buddha prohibited the monks from destroying grass and trees. Give this strict commitment to the doctrine of Ahimsa, or non-violence. Um, non-violence, non-harm. Even among ordinary people, it is absurd to say that a Suttapana Arya would possibly still fake... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it is absurd to say that a Suttapana Arya would possibly still take life if necessary. It's an absurdity. In fact, a true Suttapana never takes life nor does he violate other precepts such as those against stealing, sexual misconduct, lying or intoxicating drinks under any circumstance. Yet the writer I have referred yet the writer I have referred to insists on the possibility of the Suttapana's moral relapse in regard to the five precepts, saying that his view is based on his long time study of human psychology. He apparently regards himself as a suttapana and has studied his own mind. Moreover, he is said to be an alcoholic. And therefore, he seems to have incorporated his moral outlook into his view of the Suttabana Arya. There is, a there is a Myanmar saying that if our attitude to a man is to be correct, we should project our desires, feelings, etc. on him. But this is true only in the case of two men who resemble each other in many respects. It is certainly impossible for an ordinary man to count on his used knowledge of, say, mathema mathematics for comparing himself, himself with a specialist in the subject. Likewise, a common man's opinion of a suttapana will be wide off the mark if it rests entirely on his experience. So he's an alcoholic who says 
a Satipanas can uh, transgress the moral precepts, right? Um, so, like if you uh, don't hold the precepts when you practice meditation and study the Dhamma, you're going to end up with uh, horrible consequences such as perverting not only your own mind but the mind of others and taking them away from the truth. Yeah, so we can see again the reason that the precept says uh, to avoid or abstain from taking the uh, alcoholic uh, beverages. Um, it is, uh, I've heard it said because, you know, drinking alcohol leads to breaking the other precepts, right? So if you drink alcohol, you can just lie, and when you can lie, you can tell lies, like tell lies about the Buddha, and the Dhamma, and the Sangha, which of course, uh, I can't even uh, really think of anything more horrible than that. It's definitely a one-way leading way to Avicca. Avicca, I'm sorry, to the deepest levels of hell. So, I'm just a little bit distracted by this crazy person's utterings. Very interesting. Okay, so we've been going now for 57 minutes, as far as I can see, and I think uh, it is a good place to take a break or cut this episode off. Um, and so we have this for our contemplation. Um, the counter argument from the Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw, which I think uh, blows this alcohol, alcoholized man's uh, wrong view out of the water. I mean, yeah, I don't really have anything to add other than what a wonderful time it is to study the teachings of the Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw. And so with that, let's just pay homage to the Buddha and can end this episode. And make sure to follow along with the next episode, which should be out um, uh, in, in no long time. So thank you so much for listening and studying. And may your practice be full of insights. And may you gain both Makkah and Pala. Thank you. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa And for a second time, Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa and for a third time. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Thank you.